الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحابته ومن والاه اللهم إني أعوذ بك أن أضل وضل وزل وزل وأذرم وأذرم وجهل ويجهل علي اللهم إني أعوذ بك من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له الحمد لله first just not to be self-deprecating, but uh, the, the Zaytun Institute is myself and one other sheikh from uh, Mauritania who's teaching uh, in Santa Clara. So it's, it sounds like a big title, but it's actually not. <laughs> Don't want to give any of the wrong ideas to people. This conference is titled Muslims for Moral Excellence and It's interesting to note that the Muslims, although we have the greatest teacher of moral excellence as our guide and our prophet وسلم, the one which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, the Lord of all the worlds has said and which he said about no other human being in his book وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلِقًا عَظِيمٌ Surely you are on a great ethic, a great self form, a great character and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has said in his book inna aradna al-amanata ala al-samawati wal-ard wal-jibali fa-abayna an yahmalnaha wa ashfaqna minha wa hamalaha al-insanu innahu kana dharuman jahula that we have shown to the heavens and the earth or have offered to the heavens and the earth bearing the amana. But the heavens and the earth and the mountains themselves refused to carry them. And they also ashfaqna minha. They saw it as a heavy thing that they could never bear. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hamalah al insan. But the human being took on this amana. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us two important things about this human being. إِنُّهُ كَانَ ظَلُومًا يَهُولَ He was ظَلُوم and he was جَهُول Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in this verse two characteristics to describe the human being and his nature. The first is related to ظلم which is oppression and the second is related to جَهَل which is ignorance. And if you look in the Qur'an Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions knowledge over 700 times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions ظلم oppressors and oppression around 250 times. Out of those 250 times that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, talks about oppression, He mentions one verse that relates to the wrongdoing of others. He mentions one verse that relates to uh, wrongdoing to the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then He rem mentions 23 verses that relate to the wrongdoing of a human being to Himself. So out of the 250 verses relating to oppression, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes 25 times the object of that oppression, and in 23 of them, it is the human being to his own self. That the human being is oppressing himself. He's a valum, which in the Arabic language, fa'ul, is called, it's for mubalagha. It's a hyper, hyperbolic uh, expression for exaggeration, to exaggerate the fact that the human being is deeply oppressive by his nature. He is deeply oppressive by his nature. And he's jahul, he's deeply ignorant. And thus, in order for the human being to bear this amana as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has required him to do, then he must remove oppression from his nature and he must remove ignorance from his nature. And without the removal of these two characteristics, he cannot bear this amana. And amana is related to iman. لا إيمان لمن لا أمانة له. He has no iman, the one who has no amana. Now in a society, if you have oppression, the thing that is missing is aman. Aman is security. There's no sense of security. And it's interesting that in our countries, uh, we call the police security forces. And in reality, in the vast majority of countries of the world, they are 
securities, in other words, they are securing the countries by force for the uh, benefit of a few oppressors. This is what they're doing. The vast majority of the world is literally security forces are securing and exploiting the wealth of the country for a small handful of people that are placed over the people who are oppressors who are Ghani Moon. And one of the people who will never smell the scent of Jannah is the one who is an Imam over a people and he oppresses them. So you have in the Muslim world a state in which people are in a state of dhulm. They feel dhulm. And they ask constantly, where is this oppression coming from? They speak endlessly about the sources of that oppression. And ultimately it is related to the human being himself and herself. That we ourselves are oppressing ourselves. And that our primary enemy is the psyche itself, the nafs. The greatest enemy that you have is between your own two sides. And until that enemy is conquered, nothing can be conquered. Now earlier, uh, Dr. Kamal was mentioning about moving to another level. You see, about that there's individual piety amongst the Muslims, but how do we move to another level? But the individual piety is often deeply misplaced. And the example that he gave, with respect to his talk, the example that he gave was a perfect example for misplaced piety. When a man will hit the head of his brother, knock a woman aside to kiss the black stone. This is jahul and valum. Not only is he ignorant, but he's oppressing his brother in his ignorance. Because we don't harm a Muslim to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's mandub to kiss the hajar. None of the ulama say that it's a wajib, it's a fard during the hajj. It's mandub because the Prophet ﷺ did it. And even some of the sahaba left it because they didn't want to harm other people. And yet it is haram to harm or oppress another Muslim. So the deeply embedded sickness within the Muslim ummah is dhulm and jahal. And this is the reason why we no longer have siyada of this uh, world nor do we have uh, dignity within ourselves. We fear other people. We fear other nations. You see? We fear them. Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu said, a man of deep dignity within himself, وَلَسْتُ بِهَيَّابًا مَنْ لَا يَهَابُنِي وَلَسْتُ أَرَى لِلْمَرْءِ مَا لَا يَرَى لِيَا I don't show dignity. I don't have awe or fear of someone who has no awe and respect of me. And I don't see in any individual things that he doesn't see in me. And this is somebody who has izza, who has dignity within himself. And then he said, In tadnu minni, tadnu minka muaddati. If you draw near to me, then my love draws near to you. Wa in tanna anni, talqani anka na'iya. But if you move away from me, then I move away from you. Kilana ghaniyun an akhihi hayatuhu. Both of us have no need of the other as long as we're alive. Wa nahnu idha mitna ashaddu ta'aniya. And when we die, what greater independence do we have from each other? Now if you move from the individual level to the societal level in these statements, because I think they're important and not insignificant meanings. We have fear and awe of the so-called superpowers, of the so-called uh, developed countries, to use the term of some uh, people who have no understanding of the age they live in, right? developed countries. We, we have awe and fear of them in the Muslim world. And yet they have no respect for us. They have no respect whatsoever for us. We show them our love by imitating them because imitation is a sign of love and thus we become quote unquote a developing nation. <laughs> you see, we want to catch up. We want to catch up. Catch up with who? What's the race? When somebody from the CNN uh, asked, he was doing an interview about religious tolerance uh, in America and he, he, they came by uh, to interview me and uh, I 
I said to him, uh, what, what religions are you looking at? He said, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And I said, you know, tolerance is a big topic. And how, how long, how much time do you have? He said, two minutes. <laughs> and I said, uh, that's, that's not very much time to cover, you know, the, that subject. And he said, well, that's all they give us. And he said, you know, I don't know why they, they, they never give us. really hard to get two minutes. 30 seconds, 60 minutes is, is considered the average segment. Two minutes is a good amount of time on CNN. He said, I don't really know why. Well, one, they don't want anybody to think. I mean, that's one reason, quite clearly. And then he said to me when we were talking, he asked, you know, now Muslims, don't they realize, do you think that a lot of the reactionary uh, politics of Muslim fundamentalists and things, don't you think, in fact, that they're not recognizing that the march of progress moves on? That we're progressing? And so I asked him, you know, I, you know, let me ask you a question. If we're a bunch of lemmings and we're heading to the cliff that goes over and down into the sea, and we're all marching along like good lemmings, and some of those lemmings question the wisdom of doing that act, you know, what do you call those? Reactionaries? If the march of progress is literally taking us to the brink of destruction, then what do you say? Well, that's a good point, he said. <laughs> it's a good point. Now, if you look at uh, morality, it's very interesting because there can be no morality without knowledge. And knowledge has conduits. It has means by which it is acquired. Knowledge is not acquired out of a vacuum. The Prophet وسلم, Allah says about him in the Quran, Allamuhu Shadid al Quwa. He was taught by the one vast in power. The Prophet وسلم, himself had a teacher. The Prophet وسلم, had a book that was transmitted to him orally by his teacher. And he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was better in reality than his teacher Jibreel Alayhi Wasallam. But Allah established the sunnah that knowledge is acquired through means. Even the best of creation learned through means. Now if you look in the world now, the means by which knowledge is acquired, which hopefully the point of knowledge is not simply to have an educated person at the end, but to have somebody who is literally substantive in what he is contributing to the society, that he is not a detriment to the society. The Muslim is the one who Muslims are safe from his tongue and his hand, from the harm of his tongue and from the harm of his hand, the two ways that a human being can harm, physically and, and, and verbally. So the result of education is supposed to create an individual who is khaluq, who has akhlaq. Innama bu'ittu li utamima makarim al-akhlaq. I was sent to create. Innama is for hasar. I was only sent to perfect noble character of human beings. And in another hadith he says, Innama bu'ittu mu'allima. I was only sent a teacher. What is he teaching then? He is teaching akhlaq. He is teaching people how to move into their humanity, how to become a human being, how to live in a world which necessitates morality by the fact that we live together. We are Bani Adam. We are the Adamic people. We are the people of Uns. We are Nas. Insan is from Uns. We are people of intimacy. We are the people who are our Batin is exposed to each other. If you look at animals, Animals, most animals walk on four or crawl, and their back is what they show. They protect their batin, they protect, this is called batin in Arabic. This area of the body is called batin. The human being is the one literally who comes to people, his batin is open. This is what animals expose when they surrender. When an animal surrenders, it will often roll on its back and expose its batin to its enemy as an act of surrender. And yet, Bani Adam is, these, we are human beings. We are people that expose ourselves to each other in order to gain uns, to gain intimacy, to achieve our humanity through this mutual interaction and relation. 
So if the conduits of knowledge and information are controlled by our enemies, by people who do not want to see us become morally excellent, who do not want to see us achieve sovereignty, ascendancy, if the conduits of knowledge are in their hands, then we can never achieve anything. We can never achieve anything. And this is exactly what's happened. And if you look at the Americans, this is a very interesting article in Foreign Policy, which is an important magazine put out by an organization called the Council on Foreign Relations, which is really the intellectual, uh, it's the intellectual center of the American uh, nervous system. Really, it's the brains behind policies. They create policy papers. Samuel Huntington, in fact, the first, uh, the Cold War paper by Mr. X was first published in Foreign Policy. Now, it's interesting that Foreign Policy, that it's put out by Council on Foreign Relation, and they always use the acronym CFR. The C is for Council, so it has a K sound. The, the, the F is for foreign, so it has a F sound. And the uh, relations is for relations, ra, and it has a ra sound. And that gives you ka, fa, ra. Right? It's a very, I think it's not insignificant, right? Ka, fa, ra. Right? I mean, it's interesting that the, the jaw has ka, fa, ra written on his forehead. And the Prophet, and I guarantee you, no Arab, historically the Arabs never used an acronym. Never. If you study Arabic literature, they never used an acronym. They didn't use initials. Arabs didn't even have a period where you could put an initial. It didn't mean anything to them. I mean, and this is a society that's based on, you, you have to go to school to learn initials. That's what you end up doing. You go to school and you learn jargon. If you, if you go to medical school, you learn things like CPR, right? <laughs> you go into uh, uh, these... Uh, there's so many engineering jargon, it's unbelievable, and they use all these initials, right? So the American, ABC, CBS, NBC, it's very interesting, it's a land of, of initials, right? Kafara. <laughs> These initials. But this is a very interesting article by David Rothkopf in praise of cultural imperialism. Now this is a rebuttal because what they do is they get their intellectuals to talk to each other. And then ultimately they derive their policies out of these papers. This was written by a man who's really looking at the Samuel Huntington argument about the clash of civilizations. And he's trying to say really we have to be careful of, of you know, setting up this uh, civilizational crisis based on conflict. Because what he's saying is we actually have within our power the means to completely avoid conflict by Americanizing the world. This is what he says. So he says, for the United States, a central objective of an information age foreign policy must be to win the battle of the world's information flows, dominating the airways as Great Britain once ruled the seas. What he's saying in there is that we will not rule by force. The age of force is over. We will rule by controlling the minds. We will rule through information. We will rule by educating the world falsely through our irzatz culture, our pseudo-culture, the culture of margarine. Right? Not real butter, margarine. You see? It tastes just like butter. That's what they say it doesn't. You can't get any margarine that tastes like butter. But that's what they say on there. You dead you do, right? This is what Dajjal means in Arabic, to trick people, right? So here's what he says in here. It's, it's very interesting. Talking about exporting American ideas. American share of the world market for pre-recorded music, 60%. Music is a very powerful way of controlling the minds of the masses. Music. You see, spread Michael Jackson all over the world. Spread Madonna all over the world. Not only, you, you kill two birds with one stone. You destroy the intellects of people, first of all. Listening to that, uh, you know, de-evolved, it's, it's uh, get people dancing like monkeys, right? 
I mean, according to them, we came from monkeys and now we're human beings, right? So why, are we, why do we go back to that when we listen to those things, right? So this is what they do, is get people listening to monkey music, right? It's what it is. It's monkey music. And then prepackaged software, 75% of the world, right? Now the book market is only 32%, but they're working on it. They're working on it because soon the vast majority of the world will be reading English as a primary language. This is their goal. In fact, uh, my friend Professor Khalid Blankenship uh, gave a talk uh, at, at, in front of King Hassan in which he reminded the Moroccans that you should be ashamed of yourself. A country of 30 million people, an Arabic country with one of the greatest uh, scholastic traditions in the Muslim world, and yet your universities are teaching in French. And we have Iceland, Iceland, a country of 250,000 people in which their universities only teach in Icelandic. In other words, they take all of the information from other cultures because we don't know of any Icelandic, uh, right? What, I mean, where, what's Iceland doing up there, right? No offense to any Icelandic people, but you know, they're not producing great amounts of uh, literature and science and things like this. They're taking other literature and they're putting it into their language because they have Izza. They're proud of their language. They don't want to be culturally dominated by another language, by a foreign language, alien to them. And yet the Muslim world, with the exception of Syria, right, which has its all other problems, I mean, the kulli qawman hasanat, right? The exception of Syria, trying to attempt to use only the Arabic language, and they end up doing a lot of disservice because they create these ridiculous types of ta'rib, right? Uh, like uh, troubleshooter, barrabun al mashakil. Right? <laughs> Subhanallah. Very interesting situation we find ourselves in. Right? Now, the intelligence, they did a test about intelligence in, in Syria where they. Uh, they want to see which what its intelligence organization was the most, uh, the best, the Israelis, the Americans, or the Syrians. So that they got three rabbits, and they let them go, and then they told the Americans to go get the rabbit, the CIA. So they came back with the rabbit, and they were reading it its rights. And then the, the Israelis came back with the rabbit, it was dead. They'd beaten it to death. And the Syrian secret police came back with a donkey. <laughs> and they said, that's not a rabbit. And they said, no, no, it is. We got a confession. So we have a, a country now uh, that's literally dominating the world's intellectual conduits. We have to realize that the media in America, which is, has massive power now, and I'll just give you one example. If you want to destroy a people's uh, akhlaq, all you have to do is introduce television into their culture. Uh, that's all you have to do. You don't need to do anything else. There was a, a rabbi in London interviewed who was leading a Hasidic community in London and the BBC man asked him, why don't you have television in your community? Because they don't allow it. He said, because who wants an open sewer in their living room? Right? I mean, this is a Hasidic Jew, an Orthodox Jew that can work that out. And yet Muslims, literally, we haven't come to this uh, conclusion yet. And people say, well, brother, there's benefit in it. Well, Allah says there's benefit in wine. Right? Really, if you look at the percentage of benefits in television and look at the massive harm that it's doing in the world. Now, there's a tradition of Sayyidina Ali that says, لَتَرْفَعَنَّ رَايَةَ الْفَسَادِ فَوْقَ كُلِّ بَيْتِ Towards the end of time, the banner of corruption will fly over every house. Right? You look at the satellite dish in the last few years all over the Muslim world. Seeing literally Bedouin in the Saharan desert with a satellite dish outside of their tent. It's not funny at all. It's very devastating. I, I, there's no humor in that whatsoever for me. Because it's affecting their children. It's affecting how they see the world. The Moroccans, you, the, in the poorest parts of town, satellite dish on every single house. Go to Syria, satellite dish everywhere. Egypt, all over the Muslim world. In Arabia, 
the Arabian Peninsula, the land of our Prophet and the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, land that was purified with the blood of martyrs. And you see over all of these houses, they call it Dish, right? Dishat, right? And this, what is it doing to these cultures? It's destroying them. The uh, gerrymander, a, uh, somebody who wrote a book called In the Absence of the Sacred, documents that within five years, satellite television destroyed the Inuit culture of northern Canada. Five years. Destroyed their culture completely. A culture, an oral tradition, rever uh, the reverence of older people, of elders, tribal uh, gatherings, all of these things destroyed in five years. You see now in Arab countries, women wearing spandex, right? Seriously, you, I mean, it's grotesque. You don't even see that in a lot of uh, American cities still. And in Muslim Arab countries, and you wonder, where's the khaira? Where is the, the jealousy of the Muslims? Where is the jealousy of the, the Muslim male for their own sisters? Dressed naked like the emperor's clothes in a deep sleep, not even aware of how asleep they are. Look at our youth in this, uh, in this just in, in amongst us, look at them. With their heads shaved, wearing uh, these ridiculous pants down to their ankles, right? Imitating the dregs of this culture. What's, what's happening? We have to ask ourselves, really. We talk about moral excellence, but look at what's happening to our cultures. Look at what's happening to our people. And this is, this is planned. This is exactly what these people want to happen. It is in the general interest of the United States to encourage the development of a world in which the fault lines separating nations are bridged by shared interests. And it is in the economic and political interest of the United States to ensure that if the world is moving toward a common language, it be English. That if the world is moving towards common telecommunication, safety and quality standards, they be American. That if the world is becoming linked by television, radio and music, the programming be American. And that if common values are being developed, they be values with which Americans are comfortable. This is not a crazy man writing here. This, this, is, what, this is what the leaders of this country read. These are the papers they read. Right? This is policy. And this is what they're doing. Spreading corruption in the land. Now, interestingly enough, that he mentions here, exporting the American model, the United States should not hesitate to promote its values in an effort to be polite or politique. Americans should not deny the fact that of all the nations in the history of the world, theirs is the most just, the most tolerant, the most willing to constantly reassess and improve itself, and the best model for the future. At the same time, we should not fall under the spell of those like Malaysia's Mahathir bin Muhammad. <laughs> and it's interesting, what's he doing in there? Malaysia, right? <laughs> Dr. Kamal, <laughs> Subhanallah. Who argue that there is an Asian way of doing things. Oh, there might be something other than the American way. My goodness. Right? Anyway, this is, this is what we're dealing with, right? That's a, a, a diversion. I'm going to go through this, inshallah, very quickly about uh, morality. We have a great history of, of ethical tradition, a study in deep ethics based on the Qur'an. I mean, it's interesting, I, this is a work, I haven't looked at it and I'm very impressed just by the amount, but it's interesting that uh, the Qur'an in 114 surahs has given the world literally the greatest uh, encyclopedia of akhlaq. And not only did it give us the greatest encyclopedia of akhlaq, but it gave us the greatest model and embodiment of that akhlaq. And Aisha radiallahu anha jazahallah khairan, khair al jaza, ma adkaha. The brilliant young wife of our beloved Prophet who said, Kana khuluqu al Quran, karima khalida. His character was the Quran. If you want to know the Prophet, if you want to understand our Prophet, read the book of Allah. Because he was the Qur'an walking. He was the living embodiment of that book. And so much has been written. But if you look at Imam Abu Hassan al-Mawirdi, the great Imam from Baghdad, and may Allah help the people of Baghdad and the people of Iraq in their time of tribulation, a people 
of Sumud and Nabala, noble people and people of Sumud. One American in the uh, Christian Science Monitor said that he could not believe when he went to Baghdad last year that he did not see prostitution and yet you find it openly on the streets of the Arab capitals of the world. He did not see it in Iraq and he was expecting to see it. He'd been there in 1958 and again in 66 and then he visited it last year and he said he was amazed at the dignity of those people despite the incredible suffering that has been going on in that country. Massive suffering. That that great Imam Abu Hassan al Mawirdi wrote a book called Adab al Dunya with Deen. The Adab, the courtesy of the Dunya and the Deen, how to live in the world with Adab. And Adab is nothing other than Akhlaq. It is about Akhlaq. In fact, in the Malaysian language, I'm told that the word for somebody without Akhlaq is called Bi Adab. Someone who has no Adab. And our deen, and like uh, Shaykh Abdullah said, that the Prophet ﷺ said, Adabani Rabbi fa'ahsana ta'adibi. My Lord has given me adab. And what a perfect adab. How perfect his adab for me. And the Quran is called Ma'daba, the place where adab is learned. Imam Al-Mawardi says that the adab of dunya and the adab of deen is based on certain principles. The adab of deen is based on checking the passions. One must check one's passions. And this is done by distancing oneself from love of the world. When you look at the disease of the Muslims, our disease is not backwardness, underdevelopment, none of these things. Hubb dunya wa karahiyat al maut. Love of the world and dislike of death. This is the uh, diagnosis. If you want diagnosis for all of our problems, you don't need to read uh, books and books. Two words which the Prophet ﷺ gave, Al-Wahan. Utitu jawami al-kalam. I was given the comprehensive word. In two words, he told us the disease of this ummah until the end of time. Hubb dunya Love of this world wa karahiyat al-mawt. And disliking death. And this is where our affliction comes from. Because we lose our akhlaq out of love of dunya. This is why people lose their akhlaq. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَا حُبُّ الْمَالِ وَالْجَاهِ The love of life, uh, the love of wealth and jah, a position amongst people, is not less dangerous than two hungry wolves in the midst of fat sheep. So he says that you have to have good on it dunya distance yourself from love of the world and to understand that to fulfill the desires of the self will destroy the self and then التفكر في الآخرة so there he gives you the solution in the hadith all he's doing is interpreting the hadith of the prophet حب الدنيا وكراهية الموت you have to get rid of your حب الدنيا and you have to understand that your death eternal death is through giving the self all of its desires and tafakkar fil akhirah, think about death itself. And then he says that the adab of dunya, salah al dunya, necessitates six things. There has to be deen in order to check the passions because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this deen to check the passions of human beings. Allah does not need worship. He gave us worship in order for us to come to know Him through the subjugation of ourselves because knowledge of Allah cannot be obtained except through the subjugation of the self. The, the Quran. وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةِ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنَ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ Prayer itself is to destroy fahsha and munkar, to create a sila with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَارِهِمْ صَدَقَةً Take from their wealth صَدَقَةً تُطَهِرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا You by doing that, you purify them. And you give them tazkiyah of the self. That is the purpose of zakat, to purify the self. صِيَام كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِيَام كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْرِكُمْ لَعَلَكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Fasting is in order to gain taqwa. Hajjul bayt. فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجَّ فَلَا رَفَذَ وَلَا فُسُوقَ وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجِّ Whoever wants to go on hajj and makes it obligatory by intending it and going on it, then let him not speak of low things. Let him learn to guard the tongue. Let him not do anything that is unbecoming of a Muslim. And let him not argue during the hajj. 
It's teaching us how to live with people because Hajj is the greatest demonstration of all of the people of Bani Adam coming together. But their coming together can only be based on purification of the tongue, on purification of the limbs, and on leaving jidal, leaving argumentation. Leaving argumentation. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَنَا ضَامِنُونَ بَيْتْ I guarantee a house in Jannah لِمَنْ تَرَكَ الْمِرَى Whoever leaves argumentation. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَا ضَلَّ قَوْمٌ بَعْدَ هُدًا كَانَ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا أُوتُ الْجَدَلِ No people ever go astray after they had guidance except they're given argumentation. One of the Imams said, إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا فَتَحَ لَهُ أَبْوَابِ الْعَمَلِ وَإِذَا أَرَادَ لَهُ شَرًا فَتَحَ لَهُ أَبْوَابِ الْجِدَالِ that the one who Allah wants good, He opens up for him the doors of action. And the one who Allah wants evil for, then He opens up the doors of argumentation. Then the deen is to purify the self and to purify the society. And then the sultan, there has to be a sultan who enforces peace and justice. But yet we're told in the hadith, إِنَّ الْقُرْآنَ وَالْسُلْطَانَ سَيَفْتَرِقَانِ فَدُورُ حَيْثُ دَارَ الْقُرْآنِ that authority and the Qur'an are going to split ways. So go with the Qur'an and don't go with the Sultan. So in, if you're in an age in which the Sultan is unjust, then you must follow the Qur'an. لَا تَعْتِلِ مَخْلُوقٍ فِي مَعْصِيَةَ الْخَالِقِ And then he said there must be a reign of justice to ensure mutual love and submission. Where there's justice, there can be love. And there can be submission to authority and justice towards those who are less than us, who are lower than us. Justice towards our peers and justice to those who are above us. And then the reign of law and order to create a sense of security. And then general economic well-being. This is Imam al-Mawirdi. This is 4th century. General economic well-being. There must be general economic well-being in a culture. And this is achieved through qana'ah, through contentment with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. This is how it is achieved. It's not achieved by everybody having the quote-unquote American dream. The American dream is the rest of the world's nightmare. And that's the truth. The only reason the Americans can live the way they're living is because they're exploiting the rest of the world. And if we don't recognize that, we're deluding ourselves. Really, we're living in a delusional state. How can you live like this? How can you consume 60% of the world's produced energies and produce goods? It's what Americans are doing. The food that they're eating. Massive consumption. One of the sheikhs from Mauritania, when he came here, he couldn't believe the food consumed. The amount of food on the airplane, he said he was so shocked. And I said, the airplane, they consider that little amount of food. is not enough. And then he said, the last thing that Al-Mawirdi gave was there has to be vast hope. There has to be raja, azim. You have to have vast hope in a people. The people have to have hope for the future. One of the signs of the demise of this country is that they're losing hope in their future. Really, they're losing hope. The U.S. News today had this thing that everybody's excited about how good the economy is. And immediately below it, it had an article, most Americans feel insecure in their jobs. <laughs> but see, they, they don't educate. They watch TV for 20 years and, and they can't see that there's <laughs> something wrong with those. One's right above the other. They, it won't occur to them. Right? The MTV generation, they can't, they can't think. Right? And the I Love Lucy generation as well, the whole lot of them, right? It's not just MTV, it started long before that. And then he puts a stress on Ulfa. And he says that the Adab and Nafs is based on Ulu al Himma. There has to be a high Himma. The Muslims have to raise their Himma up, not have Himma Daniya. They have to have Himma for Akhira and not Himma for Dunya. Himma is your concern and it's related to Ham, which is anxiety. Ibn Hazm said the foundation of the human situation is anxiety. Fardul Ham is the most important concern to the human being, to push away anxiety. And this is very interesting because there's a trade-off. I, I need to, because we have Aisha and things. Right? There's people, I haven't prayed Aisha, so I need to, to, to stop. Mashallah. I'm going to, uh, inshallah, tomorrow time. Yeah. So, alhamdulillah, I mean, the, of, of words there is no end, they say. Right? One of my shaykhs, he told me that the Adhan went for the, the prayer in Medina, 
and somebody was telling a story and he got up to leave and some other people stayed and we walked out and he said Al-Qasas ma tan tasif Stories never reach a middle point and I didn't understand it when I first heard I asked him what it meant he said he said uh, that one story leads to another right then you never get to a middle point if you're on a journey you know we're halfway there but when people are telling stories one story leads to another and that's why we have things like prayer to remind us we're, we're almost you know we're almost there to our deaths we're all we're all going to die uh, this Mauritanian Sheikh who came when we were in the airport we were on this escalator uh, moving along and he, he'd never been on one before and he was just looking at it and uh, we're moving along and we had the bags and everybody's sitting there and then he looked at me and he said subhanallah he said this is exactly like dunya he said, you think you're standing still, but you're headed toward your death. Basira. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's seeing things, taking ibra from things. All, all these you know, people just thinking that we're all standing still and we're all heading towards our death. And what a journey. So, inshallah, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, give us tawfiq and give this ummah tawfiq and give uh, the Malaysians tawfiq, inshallah. Right? Because they're plotting against them. They're bothered. I mean, the fact they mention that in there, don't be deluded by... You see, they're worried. They don't want a, a model of a Muslim country in particular. Right? They do not want a, a model which people can say, well, the Malaysians did it. Which means... Because, see, Muslims are so negative now. Right? Everybody just throws up their hands and say it can't work. But then, if, if it actually begins to... You know, a society begins to actually achieve some things in this world, Suddenly other, other societies are inspired by it. And they can say, SubhanAllah, well, if they can do it, we can do it. And what we say, if uh, the Salaf could do it, there are examples, and inshallah, Allah give us tawfiq. Wa jazakum Allah khairan wa salamu alaykum.